chapter 65. <clears throat> All the month of November, Mason and Dixon run the east line. 11 miles, 20 chains, 80 links from the post marked west in Mr. Bryant's field, now marked east as well, eastward to the shore of Delaware, from which the five degrees of longitude in the original grant were to extend. It is a task they might have subcontracted out to any of dozens of local surveyors. Industrious pair, speculates Captain Jean, unless you be rather jealous to possess the line in its entirety. As who would not, Dixon replies, five degrees, 20 minutes out of a day's turn, Time enough for all sorts of activities. Eat the wrong fish. Fall in love. Sign an order that will alter history. Take a nap. A globe full of people and not one is ignorant of the worth of twenty minutes. Each minute a pearl. Let slip one after the next into oblivion's gulfs or 21 minutes if you add another quarter of a degree, twinkles the Chinaman, crossing Ohio, as you might say. It was five and a quarter degrees that the Jesuits removed from the Chinese circle, in reducing it to 360 bit like the 11 days taken from your calendar, isn't it? Same questions present themselves. Where'd that slice of azimuth go? How will it be redeemed? Perhaps your five degrees of visto were meant to be a sort of repository. The surveyors exchange grimaces. What now? Can he be serious? Have they another fictitious Spaniard in the offing? Wouldn't each degree simply have been widened by just a hair to make up for the loss? Dixon gently in a voice Mason has heard him use with the pack horses that the Kellogg brothers, their pack men, vouch a daft. So that, in some way, so should I imagine, congenial to the Oriental beliefs, thy missing degrees are distributed indistinguishably throughout the entire entirety of the circle. And what may that be? Slender blade of planetary surface they took away, not be concealing, kept uh, Zhang dementedly on, oblivious. Twenty-one minutes of clock time and eleven million square miles. Anything may be hiding in there. More than your Herodotus, I nor immortal Munchausen might ever have dreamt. The fountain of youth, the seven cities of gold, the other Eden, the canyons of black obsidian, the eight immortals, the victory over death, the defeat of the wrathful deities. History's ever secret, land whose surveys will be will never be tied into any made here. In this priest-tainted 360, blue seas as oceanic depths called into being by Mathesis alone, without shores, 
nor any but their own weather blowing in from nowhere upon the official globe. Nor ought we to be forgetting the heavens as above, so below, stars beyond numbering, planets unsuspected, planets harboring life, morally intelligent life, an extra sign of the zodiac, though of course running a bit narrower. Yet might it stretch out north to south, perhaps even all the width of the semicircle, a dragon, a Pennsylvania rifle, a surveyor's line. Am I content with this? Was that your question, Dixon? I didn't say anything. Of course you did. You were muttering over there. I heard you. I heard it. Happen I may have audibly wondered. How one, with so much investment in the matter of the eleven days, could be much offended when the hysteresis be expressed in degrees, and taken to the correct scale, declares Captain Zhang. What is there to choose? Both are experiences of that failure of perfect return that haunts all for whom time elapses. In the runs of lives, in company as alone, what fails to return? is ever a source of sorrow. And a lively issue among the metaphysical, I am sure, Mason attempts to beam. The even yet more compelling question just now, however, being, are you planning on growing particularly violent any time soon? You cannot shame me. I have lost shame. As one loses a boar at an assembly, creeping behind, whispering, you should have left her in Quebec. Your fate was never to bide this long, amid this continental folly, folly that you yourself are now fallen into. Sounds like half the axemen, notes Mason. The half who aren't past, them, past themselves over that zhuzha, adds Dixon. This quite exceeds, sirs, the unsophisticated grunting of backwoodsmen. She was the captive ward of my life's great enemy. Though any sight of her, even at a distance begin in delight. Soon enough shall his evil features emerge from and replace those beloved ones. Yet do I desire, not him, never him, yet given such terms, to desire her, clearly I must transcend all shame or be dissolved beneath it. And you're doing an excellent job, exclaims Mason. Isn't he, lads? They return to Harlan's in early December and get busy with the Royal Society's degree of latitude. No telling if they'll ever take the west, li the west line west of Allegheny. All is in the hands of Sir William Johnson. Pleasant gentlemen, recalls Captain Chang, though what in distant parts be judged madness, the wanderer may not say or even know. Like others of the party, he is apt now and then to drop in without prior notice at the Harlands, who are ever happy to have the company. Advent sees the forming of something near a club, 
for the purpose of discourse upon the topic of Christ's birth, repairing after dinner to the horse barn, Captain Zhang and the Reverend Cherry Coke being observed among those in faithful attendance. The astronomers prove less consistent, though willing to pronounce upon points of chronology or astronomy, or both, such as the star that brought the Magi. "'Twas either a conjunction of planets,' Dixon opines, "'or a comet. "'In 7 BC, according to Kepler, "'Jupiter and Saturn were conjunct three times, "'and the next year Mars joined them,' Mason declares. "'No one who was out at night could have failed to notice that. "'It must have been the most spectacular event in the sky. Again, in perhaps 12 BC, Captain Zhang points out, appeared the late comet of 59, whose return to our era, Dr. Halley predicted, the tail tapered ever toward the sun, thus able to direct your magi, or perhaps mine, after each sunset to the west. Gentlemen, surely, the reverend as mildly as he may advances, Christ was not born any time before Christ. If, says the geomancer, like all Christian nations, you accept the reckoning of Dionysus Exegus. Then Herod died in 4 BC, yet the Gospels have him alive when Christ was born. The taxation decree that brought Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem may have been as early as 8 BC. There are a number of these strange inconsistencies. Unless the death of Herod be wrongly dated, for Dennis the Meagre, as we know him, was an agent of God. God should have found another agent, remarks Dixon in the same side-of-the-mouth delivery as Mason. Mr. Mason, the reverend turning to shake his index. I didn't say that, Mason protests. Did I? End of chapter.